And our third speaker will be Leslie Vinjamuri, co-director of the Center for the International Politics of Conflict, Rights, and Justice, and an associate professor in international relations at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. She's one of the world's experts on the political effects of international justice and its relationship to peace and democracy. She's published numerous book chapters and journal articles on this topic, including one that all of you in the Global Challenges course should remember. She wrote, co-authored the article with Jack Snyder that you read for the class. And her talk will be, why is there a backlash against the International Criminal Court, and does it matter? Uh, thank you to the organizers, Eva, um, all of you at Mount Holyoke, and to my dear friend and former colleague, John Westrom, um, for having me out to Mount Holyoke. It's a pleasure to be here, and the only way that I can reciprocate is to say that I teach at the School of Oriental and African Studies. We are a public university, and if you're in London, our events are pretty much all open. So I would strongly encourage you to take a look at the web page if you're heading that direction and turn up. Uh, it would be great to see any or all of you there. Um, it's an honor also always to be on a panel with two women like this. I've been on panels with Catherine. It's often uncomfortable, but it's always exciting, and it, it is always an honor, I must say. Uh, I, mean, I, I don't always agree. I often don't agree, but I am a great fan of her work nonetheless, and it's pushed the debate forward in a tremendous way. Um, I also found the talk last night remarkable and I'm sticking primarily to the title of my talk, not entirely, I, and I did amend some things based on Juan's remarks last night. Um, but I, I want to say two things before I begin. One is I think it's, it's incredibly important to be clear, and then I'll go on not to be clear, about what we mean by transitional justice, because I think it's easy to make claims when we use the term very generally, and much harder to make careful, specific, testable claims uh, when we specify exactly what we're talking about. Um, so I would put that out there, I guess in some ways, in a response to some of the pieces uh, that Catherine's mentioning. Um, and the other thing I would say, you know, the title of my talk, Why Is There a Backlash Against the International Criminal Court? And Does It Matter? I'm also going to talk about pushback and contestation. And I think my take home point is that it does matter. And it matters in part because of what we saw last night uh, from one of really the most distinguished public thinkers and practitioners on transitional justice, Juan Mendez, who is clearly thinking in a deeply complicated um, and sophisticated way, not that he wasn't always, but you can see the evolution of thought. And I think it's reflective of a lot of what's gone on in the real world in the last decade, but also in the last two years, that we're seeing much, much uh, increasingly, not that it wasn't sophisticated in the past, but much more complex and much more sophisticated thinking about those who were really proponents of international human rights generally and international justice specifically. Uh, so today there is, I would argue, a great deal of pushback against the International Criminal Court and also against transitional justice, although I'm going to focus on the International Criminal Court primarily. Great powers, as we know, especially Russia and China, since the Security Council referral of the situation of Libya in 2011 have been unwilling to support further referrals. Emerging powers like India remain outside the regime as well as most Middle East countries. Um, and in Africa, there's been a concerted effort led by the African Union to alter the terms on which the International Criminal Court engages in Africa. Pushback, as I mentioned before, especially since Libya has engendered a serious rethinking of the role of justice in conflict situations, especially among its strongest proponents. Juan Mendes talked about the complexity and difficulties in conflict situations last night. Louise Arbor, who I imagine is familiar to many of you, she's currently head of the crisis group, former chief, or pro chief prosecutor for the ICTY and has held many very distinguished roles. I imagine she's going on somewhere soon because the role has been advertised for head of crisis group. Um, she remarked in Oxford uh, earlier this month, just a few weeks ago, that quote, and you can find the speech on the internet, resistance to accountability is at an all-time high. This is coming from somebody who spent her entire career working at the very highest levels to construct and practice within this set of structures. Um, this also mirrors broader trends in human rights and democracy promotion in a report by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, which I think was published just a week or so ago, written by Thomas Carruthers and Saskia Breckenmacher. 
talking about human rights and democracy promotion. They said pushback is global, the trend is lasting, and the response is inadequate. So these are people who really are very much coming at this from a deep position of principled commitments, not all the same, not, and I've referred to a few people not all working on the same issue. What is the nature of that pushback and does it matter? Um, most, though certainly not all of the arguments that are being marshaled um, to push back and criticize and critique the International Criminal Court in particular, from, especially from its targets, but also from some of those who remain outside the regime, are made along the line of, from the position of a principled commitment. So they're not made outside of the idea of principles. We can, of course, argue about whether or not these are manipulated or not. I'm going to run through three of these, and you'll be familiar with them, but I think it's really important to put them out there. Sovereignty is the first one, and we know this. The idea and the claim that is articulated again and again, both by those who are targeted and by some major emerging powers that are outside the regime and really need to come into it if it's going to be effective and spread wider, I would argue. Uh, the argument sovereignty is the fundamental norm of the international system. This is sometimes linked to democracy and the right of people to choose their leaders through elections and for those leaders to be free from um, investigation and arrest warrants. Secondly, and probably the most dominant critique that's made of the International Criminal Court is about hypocrisy and selectivity. And the hypocrisy critique is, is potent. Many states claim that the International Criminal Court is pursuing justice selectively, and it really takes place along, it's made in, on three dimensions, I would argue. The critique is not new. Um, but it's become more vehement with the two Security Council referrals and especially with Libya. Um, so the three types. First uh, is this, this idea that cases, general country cases, are chosen selectively. All of the ICC cases, we know this, are in Africa. Um, even those referred by the Security Council. Libya and Sudan have been referred, not Syria. Now we can say not North Korea, now that there is this commission report on the table. Not Israel and not Afghanistan to name just a few that could have become under the, under the, the ICC through a referral. Um, the decision to identify cases has too often come from three very powerful states through the mechanism of the uh, Security Council <coughs> referral. This is the second form of hypocrisy that states that have not themselves even joined the ICC have such a strong role in deciding what cases will actually be referred <coughs> to the court, not only what will be referred, but also what will not be referred. And thirdly, the third type of, um, the third claim made about hypocrisy and selectivity is that even once the ICC has taken up cases, the court has not pursued justice with equanimity. It has been selective. So in Uganda, the LRA are targeted, but the government of Uganda, which we know has committed extraordinary crimes, has not been investigated, and many people, including my colleague, Phil Clark, um, and David Bosco, in his recent book on the International Criminal Court, Rough Justice, argue that this was a brokered deal. They understand, they recognize the evidence is inconclusive, but they've done extensive interviewing. In some cases, this hypocrisy is formalized. The referral of Libya gave an exemption to non-state parties, in other words, the United States. The third type of critique and I think it's really important to rescue this, is again comes from a principled commitment uh, to peace. We often, when we say peace versus justice, the idea is that peace is terrible and justice is good. If you go to The Hague, which I'm sure many of you had, you know, the, the, the most important building arguably is the peace palace, the peace palace. So the, the argument is made often, peace is a fundamental value, it's necessary for stopping human rights abuses, as Catherine has reminded us. And the ICC, in some cases, is perceived to have removed states' ability to negotiate the compromises that make peace and justice possible. In Uganda, the government's request to drop the case against the LRA in the run-up to peace talks was declined. In Yemen, it is unclear, as we speak now, whether the GCC-negotiated amnesty will be allowed to hold South Africa felt constrained in its negotiations with Libya during that conflict by the ICC, the Security Council referral, 
And in a discussion of Syria and what to do, Ken Roth, who is the executive director of Human Rights Watch, argued, the South Africa strategy is no longer an option. So this idea amongst some within that set of advocates who are really working to create policy, that there isn't, that there isn't this room for flexibility and compromise is certainly out there on, this, on, on the table. And the idea that, that South Africa would no longer be an option, which I think is a debatable question, uh, seems deeply problematic to me. You can argue that these claims are not new. I think they're being asserted in far more serious ways, and I'd like to really quickly mention five of them. Um, firstly, the one that we focused on most in the peace and justice debate, some individuals are simply refusing to go, they dig in their heels, they fight fiercely. This is the strategy that's received a lot of attention. It has not disappeared, but it's not the dominant threat to the ICC. Why? Because the international court and the states that support the ICC, but also earlier courts, have either made pragmatic adjustments to avoid pursuing justice in too great an extreme, Syria, North Korea, or they have relied on other types of statecraft like military force to shore up justice. This is ultimately what happened in Libya. Without this, I see no evidence that individuals under indictment have decided to capitulate or turn themselves in. A second strategy, individuals targeted by the ICC to bolster their domestic support by repudiating its legitimacy and sometimes, as in Kenya, forming very strategic electoral alliances built in part around this rhetoric. Unfortunately, in Kenya, the strategy was effective in bolstering the support for Kenyatta and Rutu's um, most, in their most recent elections. So this is really about articulating this as a, an illegitimate move. Third, states have actively sought to design alternative rules based on domestic or regional norms to challenge the authority of the ICC. This is what's happening in Africa, as the African Union has continually challenged the ICC by stating that it subscribes to the norm of immunity for heads of state, and this has become its key position. It has also sought to devise rules for how such trials would take place in absentia, but the more fundamental effort has been about rewriting the rules of sovereign immunity. Fourth, and related, but taking this yet another step, States have sometimes sought to shift the locus of authority to regional institutions with separate rules. The African Union has so far made very little progress in this area, but continues to pursue the idea of an African court on human and people's rights. And finally, and most serious, many states simply continue to opt out. I work at the School of Oriental and African Studies, and I can promise you that the International Criminal Court is not apart from the fact that there are several of us there who are deeply interested in it, it's not the major topic of conversation in many of the countries that are, that are actively uh, researched by the scholars there, by the students who are engaged. Um, in the Middle East, opting out has meant pursuing alternative strategies or none at all, an amnesty in Yemen, victors' justice trials against the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and against Saddam Hussein in Iraq. Only in Tunisia has transitional justice looked better, but of course this is because Tunisia looks better. Libya had no choice but to opt in, but it remains to see whether the decision not to admit al Sanusi to the ICC, in other words, to accept complementarity in this first case, and to leave him to be tried in Libya, whether this will lead to a trial of the sort that international proponents of justice will accept. I have not mentioned Asia, but very few states in Asia have joined the ICC. I think about 18 of 48 in Africa, it's 34 of about 55. So why so much pushback now? The accountability norm and the institutions that give it shape are not static, and this was, I thought, brilliant um, last night in Juan Mendez's speech, but deeply problematic, too. The, and I, what, I, what I loved about what he said last night was that um, transitional justice was constructed through societal practice that came from within, and now we have the law. And that is, that is where my concern begins to kick in. The accountability norm, the institutions that give it shape, have become increasingly formalized, less malleable than when they were initially conceived in Latin America. The terms of jurisdiction and how it's decided are very clearly set. The standard for an admissibility claim, complementarity, the, the request for complementarity seem to become fixed on a very high and very specific legal standard and they do not leave room for alternative practices like we saw in South Africa or Chile, which Juan Mendez tells us now is one of the greatest 
uh, the states that is committed most to investigating and dealing with impunity, but at the time it was very different, or Mozambique, or even Argentina at the time of transition, which is really what transitional justice is about. This marks a fundamental shift from earlier practices and understandings of transitional justice. Transitional justice was defined by pragmatic compromises made during the moment of transition that combined, and this is really important, um, that combined the aspiration for truth and justice with the recognition of what it took to create sustainable political bargains to forge the path for a successful democratic future. Ken Roth tells us, as I mentioned, the South Africa option is no longer possible. Christine Bell, a, North, a, a female scholar, very prominent practitioner, um, human rights advocate in Northern Ireland, has argued that in Northern Ireland, there was a fundamental recognition that compromises were central to transitional justice. And I've heard her often bemoan the fact that she's become very much a central part of the international transitional justice network. And she understands the complexity of asking others to, to, to meet certain standards. Finally, the cases where transitional justice were originally defined were hard cases. There were spoilers that needed to be contained in many cases, sometimes through negotiation. But the cases that the International Criminal Court has taken on today are equally hard, and in many, many circumstances, they're far harder cases. So an uncompromising set of standards being applied to conflict situations that are far more difficult to resolve has been at the root of much of the type, much of the contestation and pushback that I outline above. Anti-Western rhetoric is very easily mobilized in many of the cases that the ICC has looked at. And it's sometimes done in ways that reinforce very pernicious forms of sectarianism. Juan Mendez suggested last night that transitional justice was the product of societal practices, and then we have the law, um, which came later. This is right, and it means that in much of the world, the standards and pressure for dealing with justice during transitions is being decided outside the country and outside the region. This is very different, and it's a key reason, I think, why we are seeing so much pushback. And in the cases where states have referred themselves to the ICC, this has often been the product of solicitation. It has often served the purposes of governments who wish to see rebels that they are fighting come under the radar of the ICC. The ICC has been heavily instrumentalized in Uganda, just to name one place. So do the pushback and the backlash matter? Yes. It is unlikely that the ICC will be able to deliver peace and justice in conflict situations, I would argue, absent a much more comprehensive response by the international community, and even then, it's difficult. If the ICC cannot do this, then contestation and pushback will continue in their multiple forms and be more corrosive of the institution. There is a de facto recognition of this in many cases, but I think it hasn't gone far enough. The compromises that Louise Arbor has outlined, both in her Oxford lecture and also in an earlier lecture in October, I think are very necessary and represent an enlightened return to the early days and practices of transitional justice. Three options. One is compromise, and this is I think where I would put Louise Arbor, I really recommend that you listen to or that you read her speech and what she recommends on Colombia. But the idea here is that you pursue both peace and justice, you compromise on both, you get as much as you can, but you accept very real and very necessary compromises, leniency for those most responsible in Colombia, but not impunity. A second idea out there is separate tracks for peace and justice. And probably this means you no know, Security Council referrals. A third recommendation is sequencing, peace first, then justice. I'm not sure where Mon, what my interpretation of Juan was last night. I think he proposed a very sophisticated version of this last night, but it wasn't clear exactly to me. My own view would be a version of sequencing, but with the injection of the idea of accountability at a very early stage in the form of investigation and documenting but not one that turns over decisions about actual trials to a judicial body until after the political judgments and strategies necessary to bring conflicts to an end have been exercised. 
So I support the Commission of Inquiry reports on Syria and North Korea, but I do not support a referral at this time. In the moment of transition, we need to rescue the notion of compromised justice that firmly inserts and articulates the aspiration of a principal commitment but is clearly designed to be forward-looking. The key question must be, what does it take to create the best possible prospects for reconcilia reconciliation and democratization? Thank you.